Support for this program is provided by the men and women of the Louisiana Forestry Association. Through sustainable forestry, LFA members promote the health and productivity of Louisiana's forests for generations to come. Good evening and welcome to Louisiana Public Square. I'm Beth Courtney. And I'm Craig Freeman. Tonight's topic, the power of online social networks, was selected from a number of subjects suggested by members of the Youth Council of the Louisiana Commission on Civic Education. LPB is proud to be a part of the commission and commends its work in promoting good citizenship among our youth. And young people, it turns out, are the biggest users of this, these social media network sites. Well, if the internet is the information superhighway, tonight's topic is the carpool lane. Millions of people are getting together on the web in virtual communities, using sites like Facebook and MySpace. They're connecting with long-lost friends, joining social and political causes, and just plain hanging out at the worldwide digital mall. Facebook, MySpace, LinkedIn, Twitter. Six years ago, no one had heard these words. Today, these four internet companies have a subscriber base of nearly 350 million people. Recent high school grad Autumn Williams is one of them. I have a lot of friends in different states, so I use MySpace to keep in touch with them since I don't get to see them all the time. And we can put our pictures on there, and we can comment them, and we can message each other, and it just all, it, work, it works out nicely. I love it. Two out of three online teens use social network sites. Users construct individual profiles and connect those profiles to other users or groups online. These connections form personal networks, virtual communities that reflect and support pre-existing offline relationships. Between 2005 and 2008, the number of adult Internet users who had created a social network profile quadrupled from 8 percent to 35 percent, according to the Pew Internet and American Life Project. 75% of online adults 18 to 24 use social network sites, but use declines with age. Only 7% of online 65-year-olds and older have social network profiles. Blogs are considered social media because they allow readers to interact by leaving comments and posting their own visual material. About one in four American adults read a blog at least once a month, according to Forrester Research. Twitter, the current social media poster child, can be thought of as a tiny blog that you can access on your computer or your cell phone. Twitter users send very short messages called tweets to those who have signed up to receive them. Lafayette internet marketing expert Paul Cheney is a big fan. Twitter is sort of like the 24-7, 365 ongoing networking cocktail party. Okay, it's where you just uh, walk into the room and you jump into a conversation that's going on and begin to participate. Some critics are irritated by the trivial nature of many posts, but the number of Twitter users increased by 2,500 percent in the month of March 2009. All of these social media platforms are affecting life in America in obvious and not so obvious ways. Traditional media are losing audience. More people now get their news on the Internet than from newspapers. Broadcasters are seeing their slice of the media pie shrink as digital natives, those born after 1980, create their own content and seek out alternative programming online. The political scene was transformed in 2008 by massive online mobilization. Some media analysts see a rosy future for civic engagement in a digital democracy. Some think technology will discourage shared experience by fostering customized media environments devoid of alternative ideas. Government agencies are just beginning to investigate the use of social media as a means of providing services to citizens. Though not a true social network site, Louisiana.gov provides a wealth of information to visitors. The Baton Rouge biking community recently mounted an online campaign to make Louisiana's roads safer for cyclists. Of House Bill 725, introduced by Representative Michael Jackson, is being pushed by Taylor Alexander and fellow cycling volunteers. 
most cyclists in the state are a member of a Yahoo group where they plan rides or promote functions or races. So we sent messages to those groups. I also posted frequently on Facebook and I started a cause on Facebook called Louisiana, Help Make Louisiana Three Feet a Law. And lastly, I started a, an electronic petition through ipetitions.com. Within five days, they had over 1,500 signatures. The bill is currently working its way through the legislature. Schools tend to have a negative view of social network sites. About half the school districts in the country forbid the use of such sites on their campuses. That's a shame because I think there's a great potential in education if it's monitored correctly and used, used correctly. Joel Hilben is the co-director of the Academy of Information Technology at Karen Crow High School. Research has shown that um, students who use the social networking sites start um, developing the 21st century skills that we're all interested in, the ability to edit content, the, abil the ability to format it in a way that they want it to look. They start thinking about things like that in, in addition to just communicating with each other. School officials often cite safety concerns as a reason to ban social network sites. But a 2007 study sponsored by the National School Boards Association said that parents and students alike reported few such incidents. The downside to any social networking site is kind of that fear of not knowing who's on the other end. Derek Picard, like many of his fellow teens, approaches life online with caution. I get a friend request all the time, and my thing is, is if I don't know the person personally, I really won't accept it. Monica Ford, computer expert with the state attorney general's office, agrees that vigilance is key to digital safety. Whenever people get online, we kind of feel more comfortable and we're not as mindful as we should be. But any information that you would normally protect in your everyday life needs to be the same information that you're protecting when you're online. Businesses have struggled with Internet security issues for years. Their newest challenge is figuring out how to capitalize on social media's economic potential. The Lafayette Chamber of Commerce has set up a Facebook page, a Twitter account, YouTube for video, and Flickr for image sharing. Marketing guru Cheney's mantra is, Participation is marketing. Uh, we no longer merely target audiences and hit them with one-way broadcast messages. What we do is we participate as a member of approachable communities. Social media engenders trust. It fosters the building of personal relationships. A lot of social media um, are commercially sponsored. Media scholar Felicia Song. So if relationships, uh, political life, are being um, sustained through these social media that have other interests outside of um, the public good, right, they have a bottom line to fulfill, um, there, there are questions about what happens to us when we engage these social media. The answers to these questions are actively being sought not just by scholars, but by political groups and corporations as the number of social network users continues to grow. We will be getting our own answers to these questions from our program participants. Our audience includes those who are randomly recruited and surveyed by LSU's Public Policy Research Lab, plus several members of the Youth Council of the Louisiana Commission on Civic Education. The majority of those surveyed are active web users. 65% check the internet or email once to several times a day. 20% check from one to five times a week. Only 14% of respondents check less than one day a week or never. Respondents were almost evenly divided in their active use of social networking sites. 52% have created profiles on these sites, 47% have not. 61% of respondents think these sites make public officials more responsive to ordinary people's concerns. 14% disagree. But only one-third of those surveyed, 33%, used online social networking to research or interact with political groups and candidates. Two-thirds, 66 percent, did not. 58 percent said the internet and social networking sites improved their ability to keep in touch with friends and family a great deal. Only 17 percent saw little or no improvement from their use. So let's start there. How many of you use social networking sites and why? Does anybody use any of the stuff? Facebook, Twitter? Are you tweeting, Deborah? Uh, yes, I use Facebook and MySpace and a few others. 
Um, I'm a writer and I'm a newly published author, so my books are networked by going through that. And so it helps to actually get in touch with people, Marilyn. You are not in your head? Yeah, I don't use Facebook or Twitter. <laughs> Either one, I use uh, email a lot and I, and I do some political what do you call it? Social networking. <laughs> so how do you social network if you're not using Facebook or MySpace or those sites? I don't know. Now, my <laughs> I, because I, spend, I think I spend entirely too much time on the Internet anyway. <laughs> if I get involved in something else, I'll be there for all day long. I understand. So you want to stop. Ben, you, you're nodding your head. You agree? Uh, definitely, because whenever I get on Facebook or MySpace, I start, you know, just saying random things, updating my status, but then I'll get distracted by other things on the internet or just going and looking at other people's profiles or things that they posted and pretty much stay on there for a pretty good amount of time. Well, isn't it a problem? You know, aren't we losing productivity because we're spending time on the internet updating our sites and updating our profiles? <laughs> Eric, is this a good use of our time? I, I, th uh, I, I'm sh I suppose it has uh, pros and cons. I don't personally use any of these social network sites. Okay. My wife has accessed uh, hmm. them and created her own on Facebook for one occasion to to get some photographs. Okay, okay, and so it's it, 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 it's a personal choice, uh, David. Um, I found that it even leads to my personal case. It helps me become more productive because there are times where I'm trying to figure out. For example, I'm a school government officer, and a lot of times there are things that I wouldn't have known about unless I had used my Facebook to see what my fellow officers and fellow respondents were saying about some of the things we were doing. And it really helps me make a more uh, informed decision on what I want to do next in terms of student government. And also, if there's perhaps um, a project that I'm working on with other people, uh, sometimes you can't get in touch with them through their phones because, you know, various issues may have come up. And you never know, maybe parents or something. But usually they figure out a way to get on Facebook. And so usually through Facebook, I send them a message and we can correspond and figure out what we want to do next. So it, it helps me become more efficient, really. Now, does, what do you think about efficiency at work or efficiency at school? Chris? <laughs> I know that I personally waste copious amounts of company time. <laughs> Researching beekeeping, um, the history of the Yad accent in New Orleans, it's just wherever catches my fancy, I've got it. You, know, you don't have to go to the library anymore. You can go online and um, look, and there's all these blogs and webs and just numerous information that you can sift through and just waste all kind of company time. Now, do you guys trust the information that you see? I mean, you know, if you're trying to figure out beekeeping issues or you're trying to figure out some other information, do you feel comfortable about the information that you get online? Annie? Well, if you're smart about it and careful, you can be. And I'm an educator, and we teach the kids never rely on just one source so you know you cross reference and, and you look around all around and, and you can uh, verify and sometimes it's interesting you see the exact same information in four or five places and you know they've all sort of borrowed from one another which raises so. another kind of concern you know uh, as, as you think about education are we teaching our kids how to kind of cut and paste but not how to think <laughs> Uh, you're going to get me started. <laughs> <laughs> There's way too much cutting and pasting, but partly that uh, it's incumbent on educators to design projects and things where students can't cut and paste, okay. and, and a lot of people are still learning how to, how to do that, how, desi how to design their course work. Okay. And, and no, I'm, what do you think? Are you a, a cutter and paster as you, you know, you're a part of the generation that, that uses more of the internet? I have been guilty of cutting and pasting a couple times, but uh, really I think it actually contributes to helping you really having it available uh, for any projects, research projects, essays you have to write. I mean, it really does help if you use it in the right way. Now, if you, like I did a couple times, have crammed or procrastinated and you need it like last minute, the next day it's due, well then you kind of change the words around a little bit, cut and paste and then make it your own. <laughs> so it's not necessarily plagiarizing, but it definitely kind of helps you I cut in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> but now, it sounds like one of the, the themes that you guys are all talking about is that you have to kind of use it the right way. And David talked a little bit about the way that you can really use it the right way for politics. Has anybody else used it to get involved politically, or not even just politically, not, you know, not, you know for bicycling or for anything else? 
That's my major. That's the major social networking I do is political. Okay. And so it helps with that? It does. Okay. Okay. It, it's not only to, to get informed, but to give your opinion. Julia? Um, I'm helping with this cause called Invisible Children, and it's to help kids in Africa. And we get all of our information from the internet. They have a huge website, and there's Facebook groups that they organize the event. They tell you where to go, what time. You can meet other people. You can post pictures from the event afterwards. And so it's really helpful to be able to know what to do and to get information and network with people. So. And when you talk about networking with people, what's our community? I mean, is, is our community a world community because of the internet now, or is it still your, your neighbors? I mean, how do we know how we interact with people, Joseph? Sure, well, I've never cut and paste, and I'm, <laughs> I, think that, I think the jury's still out on the pros and cons, but I prefer a more personable relationship with my friends and family and my customers and clients. I'm in sales and marketing and I feel like that being in front of somebody shaking their hand is a little more effective than um, what they want me to believe that they've posted on the internet about that person. So that's what I, I feel. And so it sounds like you, you, you both like the physical contact and also kind of distrust a little bit the, the online With personas. so much of the inconsistencies on the internet and you know I've used to use more of the internet than I do now and um, I found the old way cell phones and is just a little bit better than typing something online and waiting and uh, it helps me be more productive actually. Okay. You, can, you can certainly confirm misinformation. Uh, <laughs> I believe that on the internet uh, if you believe something you can solidify that belief um, even though it may not be true. Um, it's, it, it certainly has, the internet has brought the world closer together. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not a Twitter guy, I'm not a Facebook guy but uh, my BlackBerry is a appendage, um, <laughs> and the internet is very important to me. I, I use it a lot, um, and you can get a lot of misinformation. And, and part of that concern is, you know, that y it is you're attached to it, that you can't go an hour without checking your email. You can't live without finding out what your friends are doing or who's tweeting you Patricia, or, text. or texting <laughs> you, or, you know, and, and so it, should we unplug, or is it better? that we're, we stay plugged in and stay connected on this kind of virtual network? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I tend to disagree. Okay. I had an incident. I was living in the Houston area back in the mid-80s, and uh, I'd gotten on AOL and uh, just look, uh, moved to the area. So I explored what AOL had, you see. And as an adoptee, I got into the, the forum with the adoption. And, well, I, I, it ruined it for me. Uh, the, the, the pain, the agony, the hype that was passed in this forum, you know. And uh, so I, I, you know, I kind of shone away from it. I, uh, I find that uh, we're not sensitive enough. We should be more sensitive to what we put on the web because you can't <coughs> ever take it off. It's on for good. That's, a, that's another issue that we, you, you always worry about. You know, you think, okay, well, I took this off today, but pages kind of remain forever. And so that's right. we're building more and more of a permanent record online. I had an incident where as I, there was a large, uh, um, I was looking for a piece of furniture, and there was a large um, company on, on oh, three or four different uh, 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 web pages. And I picked out something, and I got on the phone, and I gave them my credit card information and all that. And of course, I had all the bells and whistles as far as being secure and, and, and uh, uh, um, all cert certified, you understand? Come to find out they were bogus. And I, you know, I ended up losing four or $500. And I'm still with the Attorney General, found out that there are very few stops out there to, if you get yourself caught in one of these situations, there's no one to turn to, right. you know. I, I, I pursued the, uh, the FCC, I, I pursued the Attorney General, the Better Business Bureau. I ended up with the Attorney General in, in uh, New York okay. is, is uh, handling the, the, the uh, fraud case, you know. Which brings up, I mean, you know, how do we protect ourselves? Yeah. And so what do we do? Is there a way that we can, we can react to this well and, and use it well, but also stay safe, especially for younger kids, Sandra. Well, I was thinking about the sexting that's been in the news lately, mm -hmm. and you know, we all do pretty um, not very thought through things when we're young. <laughs> and are these things gonna stay with these people <laughs> until forever? And how do you, you know, 
you undo that in your life. If it, you were being dumb to one person before, now you're being dumb, <laughs> you know, times, times, <laughs> times, times. Right. And is, I mean, is there any way to kind of solve this, Dan? Is there anything that we can do to, to, to protect our kids from, you know, the danger of being, uh, you know, foolish at 17? No. <laughs> just let it go. 17, that's just synonymous with stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's how I think about it. I understand. Uh, and so, I, mean, and, and, and I guess part of what you're saying is it's no different from 17 and 19, you know, in 1900 or 1920 or 1950 or 1980, young people do things that are interesting and the internet just makes it, it's a different form. Well, our 17-year-old didn't have a computer in her bedroom. It was in the living room. Okay. Okay. You know, and so you starters. can keep it safe and you can yeah. monitor, yeah. but people do silly things. Well, yeah. And so we shouldn't blame the internet for all the problems in society, and we've got to take a little responsibility. Well, I, I grew up before internet, and we did dumb things when we were 17. Right. 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 I mean, this isn't, you know, a, just phenomena for the 21st century. Okay, okay. Well, well, you know, one of the one of the real con kind of concerns is that we, you know, we, we lose some of our privacy. Mm -hmm. That you know, we give up some information, and then and and it stays forever. And so you know, I get you know phone calls at night sometimes, and I wonder how they got my information. Well, will I get emails twenty years from now from That's somebody right. that I emailed today? I have a personal experience to say that one. Uh, I never really, I mean, I knew the dangers of putting too much information out there, and I'm pretty sure that the Facebook page, at least that I have, is pretty safe. But um. I recently uh, was out one night and around in the middle of the night, I get a text from a guy that I used to go to elementary school with and I wondered how he got my number and it turned out to be a complete like strange situation where he was like, I miss you so much and I was like, I should have never put my phone number on the Facebook page. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I, I can contribute to that as well because I've had people where they're like, Hey man, uh, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna text you later. I'm like, text me how? You don't have my phone number. Yeah, I do. It's all. Oh, well, I guess I better fix that. I immediately yeah. went in because mm. I I really don't <laughs> like the idea of people just being able to go and get my contact information just whenever they feel like it. Mm. But I think just like anything else that can really be a huge asset, the internet you have to be careful. You have to keep everything in parameters. Like if you have a dog, you can't just a dog can be useful. It's protecting your house, but at the same time, if you don't treat it right, it can turn on you and it can turn out to be a really real hassle or a real burden for you just like anything else. And I think with the internet you really have to have at least a rudimentary knowledge of what you're doing and what you want to do. You can't just go in there saying, okay, let me see what all there is on here and just see what all you want to do. You need to know what you want to do mm -hmm. and you need to know your parameters. Like I might use Facebook, but there are certain parts of Facebook that I will not use because I'm really not certain just how secure or safe they are. And you know, it's sort of like that. You have to know exactly, you have to be really careful just like with anything else. And we're going to have some people that are actually going to help us be a little more careful to, to put a leash on this beast. And so when we return, we're going to be joined by a panel of experts to further discuss online social networking. Welcome back to Louisiana Public Square. We're discussing online social networking. Joining us now is our panel of experts. Michael Zenos is an assistant professor at LSU in the Manship School of Mass Communication and the Department of Political Science. He is also a deputy director of the Public Policy Research Lab. Dr. Zenos has a research interest in political communication, civic engagement, public opinion, and new media. Whitney Bro is a very recent graduate of LSU's School of Mass Communication. Whitney used blogging and social networking sites as press director of the Save Our Schools campaign to address proposed budget cuts to higher education. She has also managed new media accounts for political candidates. Cheryl Abshire is the Chief Technology Officer in the Calcasieu Parish School Systems in Lake Charles. Dr. Abshire is also the Chairman of the Louisiana Technology Advisory Commission. She serves on numerous national, state, and district committees focusing on the role of technology and curriculum integration in changing educational practice. Andrew Schwartz currently serves as an associate professor in the Information Systems and Decision Sciences Department in LSU's College of Business Administration. Dr. Schwartz's research includes emerging technologies, and he recently completed a study on LSU students' use of the virtual community known as Second Life. Let's go to our participants for their questions, and Mary, I think you wanted to start us off. One question I had was, when I connect mm -hmm. to Ben, and then Ben's connected to Marilyn, and Marilyn's connected to every, you know, so, so on. How many generations do they know about me? Does, does she 
get information about me? Does she get, com you know, how, how many generations of people before you're no longer in the picture? Do you understand what I mean? Because sometimes when I'm connected to him, there's things that people send to him that are on mine, like photos. I don't even know who, what, what, whose baby is this belong to, you know? <laughs> I mean, you don't know because you don't know where they're coming from because you're connected to so many different people who are connected to so many different people. So how many generations is your information being spread out across the Facebook world? And is there any way to, to stop is there it? A, is there a way to know that? Well, with Facebook, I think, first of all, um, that's the art of social networking, is mm -hmm. it connects you through people who you don't know. So for example, if you're looking at a Facebook page, we have the thing called news feeds, mini feeds. Mm -hmm. um, so information about Marilyn will show up in your mini feeds if you're connected to her through Ben. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, I guess, to introduce you to people that you both share in common, and that's where you get your commonly shared friends or people you share in common. So I think that's the art of it, is to connect you with people who you're not already connected with. There's a little bit of fear associated with that as well. I think that we're, we're sharing too much information or we don't have control over the information we have. That well, kind of. that's one of the things that I think um, in schools that we tend to teach children. And one of our roles is that when you go into this new arena, that you know what you're going into and you go with your eyes open. And that you have a skill set that lets you configure your own personal space that allows you to share or not share what you want to based on your own personal preferences. So. While a lot of people view it as the Wild West, mm -hmm. it really it really mm -hmm. does have parameters and boundaries. But just like you do anything else in your life, you should not go into it unschooled. And I think that's one of the things that the schools are learning to do. I know, you know, in the Calcasieu schools, we're doing a lot better job with that, starting very early with children, letting them understand about what their own personal space is, what they should share, what they should not, and how to use the tools that online media brings to them to be able to configure their lives on the web so that they can share what they want to. They, so uh, I know that, at least in EBR, social networking sites in school, they're blocked by the servers, you know, because they deem them to be detrimental to school instruction. Are you suggesting that maybe they're just making it worse by completely ignoring their existence? Should they actually be allowing them and perhaps teaching about them? Um, I think it's a balancing act. And I think that's the thing that those of us that are educators from an older generation have to become comfortable with to understand the space, understand the medium and the new communication technologies so that we don't fear it but we harness the power of it for educating students and I think that some school districts do block certain sites because the sites have not evolved enough to allow us to uh, level them so that there's different areas for different ages of students and so Facebook, MySpace, the more popular sites are really really are more adult like sites but lots of educational companies have come up with sites that are more guarded that allow teachers to be in and really view and screen the communication so that children learn the skills but yet they're still not going to be in an arena where something could happen that's inappropriate. So I don't know that we're ever going to get to where you can go on Facebook, you know, in schools, but Facebook-like sites already exist and we use them extensively. And Ben, actually, it also, we didn't touch one on the first half, but I thought there was also some issues with texting and, and communicating with teachers. Right. And yeah. I didn't know if that was a part of your question. Right, yes. Um, and my parents, a recent issue has come up between teachers and students and teachers being participants of social networking sites. And I just wanted to know, where do you think the line is drawn between, I mean, do you think that teachers should be allowed or do you think that they should not be allowed to, or they should, the school board should suggest that they don't be participants of those sites? I mean, should it just be part of the job or should they be allowed to do it because, I mean, they have their own privacy to do that? And even Andrew, with, uh, with places like Second Life, I mean, everybody's on. It's not just, uh, you know, not just students. Uh, you know, if I'd like to join a Second Life, I can do that. Sure, and we have to understand that there's differences between these different communities right. that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And Second Life is an example of a completely different approach to social networking than Facebook and Twitter. Whereas a Facebook is a one-to-one -one relationship where I have to know you to befriend you. Mm -hmm. Social networking, uh, Second Life is more of a traditional chat room in a three-dimensional format where I can meet anyone in the world. So I don't have to know you, I can still form a relationship with you. So we have to really separate those two. But when it comes to understanding these relationships, we're definitely seeing a power distance change. Mm -hmm. um, and that we can certainly talk about from our different perspectives of where mm -hmm. we're seeing this being implemented in political science and, and, and education. But as in a broader perspective, we're seeing a real change in relationships. 
Um, I know that, Joseph, you raised the point during your discussion yeah. about how you like to look someone in the eye and shake their hand. And right. to you, that's a real form of creating that relationship. Unfortunately, that relationship and those types of relationships are really going away. Uh, the, I, I use a phrase a lot. It says, we're becoming less and less connected in a more and more connected world. Mm -hmm. And what I see is a lot of people who are interested in, in connecting with a lot of people. But what do they know about that person is less and less. So I may know what you did yesterday. I may know that, that you went out to dinner and where you went out to dinner. And I may know what you had for dinner last night. I may know what time you went to bed last night, which is a common thing in Facebook. I'm, I'm tired of going to bed. <laughs> but how much do I know about your true character? Mm -hmm. How much do I know about right. who you are? And what my observation is in, in, in watching these social networking sites is we know less and less about each other. And people are more and more comfortable with that. And, and there's some, if you look at the number of couples that met online last year, one in eight marriages in America last time were from online relationships. That shows something about our relationships. <laughs> we have some examples of Second Life, you brought up Second Life, where people met in Second Life and got married inside of Second Life. And there's a, a, a case that's pending right now where a woman met a guy in Second Life and they formed a marriage. And then she caught him cyber cheating on her <laughs> in Second Life with someone else. And so now she's trying to get a cyber divorce. And so we have all these really interesting relationship issues that are coming up when it comes to these online communities. Dr. Zina. Well, I think with, with students and teachers, I mean, I know in college education, um, you know, it's, it's in a lot of ways, I think, it, social networking is unique, but it's not unlike other technologies that we've encountered before, like email. When email started to become ubiquitous, a lot of people uh, like myself found, you know, themselves being contacted at all hours, uh, and there's a higher expectation mm -hmm. for uh, the response in terms of, you know, when a student will contact you with a query and when you'll return that uh, call. And I actually have a policy where I talk about sort of when I will and won't uh, respond to those kinds of messages. But I mean, I have colleagues, it really just depends on the user. I have colleagues who hold virtual office hours in Facebook, uh, where they're in Facebook chat and it's a virtual office hour that makes them more available to their students. Uh, their students like it very much. Um, you know, there's just, it, it's really a mixed bag in terms of what, mm -hmm. what's possible and what people are comfortable with. And I think that's, you know, the big challenge of negotiating these new technologies is they create all of these new circumstances that we're maybe not entirely sure how we want to deal with at first. I think another thing, Ben, is that um, in response to the teacher-student relationship is I think the lines have blurred mm -hmm. about personal and school relationships. And I think it's uh, it's a really uh, a keen responsibility of adults that are responsible for close interactions with students in school settings to understand what is the new relationship like in Facebook, on Twitter, in the classroom face-to-face. And it's a different skill set. So I think a lot of people are wading into this arena and unsure. But, uh, but I think that it will prevail that people will, you know, slowly but surely get into the arena and understand that while I can read your tweets, if I'm an education professional, my world is opened up. And I have to be a little bit more constrained in what I do in my Facebook or in my tweets because my students may read them. And I just think it's, it's going to evolve. It's an evolving arena and it's going to take us some time and there'll be some missteps along the way but we can't throw it out in terms of a few missteps because because we'll be left behind. Well I mean I, I guess the one thing that I was thinking about is that the fact that teachers and students are interacting in a virtual world is something that's not going to be stopped. Um, I, I look at it from a student perspective. Um, I look at it from a new graduate perspective that employers can look at my Facebook. They can look at you know, the tweets that I send out as well as, as well as articles that may have been written, that kind of thing. So I think that it is also responsibility of the student to respect the virtual space. You know, your parents always teach you the importance of respecting your elders and I think that even in a internet type world you have to know those boundaries and I think one thing that Calcasieu Parish is doing really well is that they're teaching students at a young age to respect the boundaries and to bring you know that real life morality into the virtual world. Right, right. Chris? Um, I've got sort of a two part but they both tie in. Um, I was reading an article in Entrepreneur Magazine and they were talking about how they are blaming the internet for the lack of involvement. Like uh, France and, and Spain are all protesting. They protest the 20 meetings and, and America doesn't happen. There's very little protesting on stimulus packages and all. One thing is they said is the internet. Now it's in both places so I was just wondering why it would be, you know, America versus Europe. 
as far as why they don't um, get out as much. And, and the second part is, is that most universities in Europe have internet classes that you can go your whole college career without stepping foot to talk to a professor if you actually have to. And it's, I, it's like the mostly liberal arts majors, and I was wondering why the United States doesn't do that. Hmm. Well, I don't know much about the, the European context in specifically, but, or specifically, but um, I know that from studying people's political behavior and online use in the United States, it's, it's really a medium that doesn't really lend itself to a simple effect of you use the internet and therefore something happens, you increase right. or decrease. Um, you know, because of the nature of the medium, it's, it's the most responsive medium ever created to user preference. Uh, and so what we find when we study political behavior is for people who are highly interested in politics, they find all kinds of things online. And right. for those people, they're organizing protests quicker, uh, more easily than they ever could before and finding all kinds of political information. Uh, and the volume of political information that is being consumed is much more than it has been in the past. Uh, but most people are not uh, as interested in politics as people who will go out and protest, <laughs> and the internet is very responsive to their needs. And I, I heard in the earlier part of the discussion many people confirming a finding that, that I've certainly found in my data, that if people are interested in uh, anything under the sun, the internet will provide you yeah. know, great content for them to, to find out about. Um, and if that interest is not politics, then that's time they're spending uh, not out in the street protesting or engaging in other political activities. Sandra? Yes, I was curious about the information that might be used for marketing purposes. When you put information, it's just information, and it's out there, and mm -hmm. it can be mined by just anybody. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I don't even like the robocalls for the uh, car <laughs> warranties, so <laughs> the possibility of that expanding <laughs> exponentially <laughs> through uh, these kinds of things comes to mind. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Well, I, I mean, I definitely think that marketing advertising is the reason why social networking sites are free right now right, um, right. is because that ad space is available so and, and even to the degree now to where some social networking sites are actually using your user data in order to select certain ads that you might actually be interested in so that way whenever they advertise or whenever they make sales calls to potential advertisers they can say well we can guarantee you this this many clicks from people who are views who, from people who live in Baton Rouge who are between the ages of 18 and 24 and who have an interest in football I mean it can get really really down to you know um, who would be their real target audience but um, one thing that advertisers have to understand is that violating, there's a precious line that exists between the user and the advertiser, or in some instances you have the fan pages, the celebrities, that kind of things. If you violate that very solid line that exists between the two, you can find yourself in a situation where you will be completely ignored and your effectiveness completely goes away. But where that line is is completely changing today. Um, we're changing in how we relate to corporations in fundamentally different ways than we ever have before. It used to be the, a scenario where the, the corporations just put out products and we went and consumed them. I'll, I'll give you a practical example. Let's talk about Barnes & Noble, for example. <laughs> so you decide after this that you're going to go get a book, and you walk into Barnes & Noble, and you find your book, and you, you take it out. I want to contrast that with Amazon. You go on Amazon, and you search for a product on Amazon. Now Amazon, you can buy that product from Amazon, and Amazon will now tell you other books that you might like. Right. Yes. Now, I want you to pretend that that was happening in Barnes & Noble. Pretend when you're walking into Barnes & Noble, there were people th that were waiting on you saying, you might like this book, or you might like that book. It creeps us out in real life, <laughs> but in an online perspective, we're somewhat comfortable with that. We're changing our relationship with corporations. We're going toward this model where we're now demanding things of them, where we're telling them, make this product. Customization is occurring in, in phenomenally exciting ways for us as, as, as consumers. Uh, the concept is called information asymmetry. It's how much power we have as, as consumers. What the dot-com era has got, gave us is more power. Uh, I'll give you another practical example. If you look at car lots and buying a, a car, if we look at how we buy a car now, um, I bought my last, my last two cars online. I just went online, found the new car that I liked, put it in a bid in, show it up, and purchase my cars. I didn't have to sit there and haggle with them. Well, how did I do it? I looked at Kelly Blue Book, I saw how much it was worth, I put in a bid, I had the power. I didn't have to go and sit down and negotiate it. When you buy a television, you don't have to drive to five different places to look for the lowest price. With a click of a mouse, you can search. We have more power. So that relationship between us and the corporations is changing, and it's going to continue to change. Things like Twitter, if we look at recent examples of Oprah Winfrey, 
Oprah Winfrey <laughs> decided to announce KFC's new promotion, the, 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 the grilled chicken. And so she went on her, on her show and announced this new promotion. And all of a sudden, all these people rushed to the KFC website, downloaded the coupon, and showed up with a coupon. And, and, the, and the local businesses said, we can't handle the traffic. We weren't ready for this. Mm -hmm. We're seeing exponential traffic. We're seeing new relationship with the corporations. And so where that line is, I think it's going to change as we, look, as we move forward as well. And, and I think it's moving more rapidly than, than we even anticipate or can acknowledge because a younger generation of students and young adults are more demanding. And the more knowledge that that information is power theme, the more knowledge they have, the more they expect. And so marketing companies, businesses, that don't capture that youth element and don't use the creative ingenuity of young people to contribute to their companies and add on and create increasingly powerful scenarios for people to participate in are going to lose market share. And so I, I think it's, it's going to move much quicker than any of us anticipated and the demand's going to increase and new entrepreneurial companies that capture that will be the real winners in the next economy. David? Oh uh, yeah. And I, when I'm listening to all this, you know, it's really made me think about it in a way I hadn't thought about it before. And I'm just wondering, how is all, because, you know, our, our society is constantly changing. That's what makes us able to survive, you know, upheavals around the world. And I'm just, exactly how do you all think this is going to change us as a society in general, how we think about life or how we go about daily lives? Is it going to alter the way we do business? Or how, how do you think this general shift in the mindset of the populace is going to change the way America is, I suppose? Well, that's an awfully big question. But a good one. And you know, I think the thing that I keep coming back to is that, you know, it's it's uh, appealing to try to think about technology in that way. And then certainly, you know, my area of expertise is in studying the internet and politics. And, and it, at first, people wanted to see these huge changes, uh, kind of overnight, in terms of um, you know those very simple, straightforward, direct effects. Uh, but I think that you know one thing we know about technology is it, is it takes a while for people first to just figure out how to use it, uh, then to become comfortable using it and settle into patterns, uh, and then ultimately work their way into a, a different kind of use. Uh, most technologies start out and people try to use them to replace something else. Uh, and then it's, it's not until much later that they figure out that there's a, a new way to use this and there are new things that are made possible that weren't possible before. Um, that, that starts to really change their behavior, and that's a complex process. Um, you know, when we first had email, people thought, well, that'll cut down on face-to-face -face meetings. I can send emails mm -hmm. to people uh, instead of meeting with them face-to-face. -face. And now, as email has, has settled in, uh, what do we use email for? We use it to set up face-to-face -face meetings. And the more email you use, <laughs> the more face-to-face -face meetings you have. <laughs> so it's really difficult to predict um, those kinds of changes. But I think the thing that we see with this, this new technology is, is again, its responsiveness to users' interest. You know, compared to older media that would just wash over you uh, in a very limited choice environment, uh, new media offer unparalleled amounts of control for the user, not just in terms of you know, what they want to pay for something and how they want to pay for it, but, but where they want to go to find the information, who they want to talk to about it, uh, how they want to go about uh, spending their time. And so I think you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to come up with a simple answer. Um, to that question. One thing I'd slightly disagree with, sure. with, you, with, with, with you about is um, the rate of technological change. Uh -huh. I think it's unparalleled the rate of technological change we're seeing. And if yes. you look at how long it, take, it took for the radio to achieve a market share of 50 million people, it's 38 years. Mm -hmm. It took 38 years for the radio to get a market share of 38 million. It took about 13 years for television. It took four years for the internet, three years for the iPod, and two years for Facebook. Mm -hmm. That's, a, that's phenomenal if you look at those statistics. The rate of technology change is phenomenal. <laughs> and I, I think there's no predictive model that's valid because it is such an evolving medium. And the technology, because if that were the case, a lot of people would have bought stock in a lot of different companies than they did. And a lot, a lot different money would have been made. But I think young people such as yourself, young entrepreneurs and people that are learning in a different mindset are going to create situations for uh, for business opportunities, for learning opportunities that I don't think any of us can fathom mm -hmm. because I really think that the technology evolution and not revolution, it's really an evolution, has changed the way people think and work and uh, meet and, and I don't think we can predict that and I, I think 
sometimes I wish I could go back and start over again because it did take so long for all of this to evolve in my lifetime. And looking at 20 and 25 year olds, it is such an exciting time to be a young person because there is no way to predict what your future will be. Ours was, mine was pretty predictable, but yours is unpredictable. And to me, that's a very exciting thing that you're gonna be able to capture a life that you can't even anticipate or expect. Ms. Bro? And I'll say as a 21 year old, my opinion, I guess will differ from all of the PhDs up here, <laughs> but um, I actually think that our generation, once we get too much of something, we tend to go find something else. Right. So I think once we get too much of social networking, too much, we're away from the, like Joseph said, the, in face to face interaction, I actually think that that will come back slowly but surely. Facebook will lead to the face to face contacts. Um, the conversation between politicians and their constituents over Facebook or over Twitter or whatever will lead to more in house council type meetings. Th I mean, th that's just my opinion, but I'm only 21 with one degree. So <laughs> I, I, I would <laughs> help <laughs> that. I'm kind of like Joseph. I, I like face to face, I hate the telephone. I think maybe the internet is kind of a in between for me, you know, where where I can operate. But I was thinking about somebody that said, uh, we we come in contact with more and more people, but we know less and less about them. And I was thinking about neighborhoods. We don't know our neighbors anymore. Is that part of the reason? Mm -hmm. and, and you know, it's getting tougher. It's harder to figure out who's next door, but you know who's in Africa. Or yeah. is. <laughs> 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 uh, Julie. I think the media has given a negative view kind of to Facebook and MySpace because they've been like so-and-so got raped and killed off that. I know a lot of my friends' parents are like terrified and like they won't let them have one at all. I was wondering like what y'all thought about that and if you think they're going to have any more of a positive view in the future. And thinking maybe even about uh, about Second Life, Dr. Schwartz, is, sure. you know, I mean, are, are, are people comfortable allowing their kids to hop on and, and take this new persona? Sure. And I, I think we do have to be careful. I think we've talked a lot about how we need to be careful and approach it cautiously. Mm -hmm. uh, we were even talking mm -hmm. and watching the discussion earlier about how uh, before there was sexting, there was a Polaroid camera and a, photo and a copy machine. So really some of these things, they, we have a new medium to facilitate these, right. but really a lot of the problems are inherent social problems that we've dealt with for a long time. Um, as, a, as a parent, um, I can tell you that when I, when I watch what my kids are going to do online, um, the, we, we had mentioned about putting it in a pub, computer in a public place. There's some steps that you can take to make sure. If you're a parent, join Facebook. See what you're put, your kid's putting up there. If you don't know, then you'd be very worried. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I found out that uh, one of my relatives has sold their house before I, on Facebook before I knew an email. I found out that their dog died on Facebook before I knew an email. <laughs> I, I, that's how we, we, we learn about people. And as a parent, be informed. Join these social networks. Ask what they're putting up there. Inform them, and definitely you're doing a lot of this in the school system. Inform them that when you're putting this stuff online, it is going to be there forever. They are doing it. All employers are going on Facebook, and they are going to look at you. Um, I see a lot of seniors getting close to the end of their, of their graduation, and all of a sudden, Facebook is really <laughs> clean. Uh, all that stuff gets deleted. But the reality is, you are connected. We talked about this earlier. And so while the picture may go off of your account, it's still out there in pu for public knowledge. So you have to be very careful and approach this very cautiously. Um, I just wanted to ask a general question of all of you. Most of you are academics, and you've sort of worked in that academic area where you build on the experts that came before. And the question um, now sort of has to do with the wisdom of the crowd and, and wikis and Wikipedia. And, and um, I don't know, how, how do you think that's going to affect knowledge? I mean, that's a big, too big of a question. But you know what I'm asking about? The, the wisdom of the crowd, and does it, is it just going to filter down to the wisdom of the experts in the I, end? I don't, I don't think that it's changed that much. You know, there's, there, uh, before I was a, Chief Technology Officer was a school principal, and I was a library and media specialist. And the skills that I taught students there are no different online, and you know, in 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 a in a published print media. That be a be a, a, a perpetual skeptic, mm -hmm. and you know, always be sent a little cynical, and always validate your sources. And those are skills that whether you're online, or you're in print, or you're mm -hmm. face to face, you know, you talk to someone and they tell you something. <laughs> You know, ha have a healthy, you know, have a healthy uh, skepticism about that, unless you can validate it. And I think that the medium has changed, 
but the questions haven't. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, you know, the skills that you need to really evaluate validity of sources and resources and question and seek more information is a skill that hasn't changed. I just think there's more conversation about it, but I think it's the same issue, it's just a different medium. Well, I just sort of wonder if the crowd is wise. In a, in a way so that the experts are. The age old question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. That, Wikipedia yeah. does sometimes require citations. So yes, if there's know. even a, right. a way to follow up to see if what's being published on that site is mm -hmm. in fact true. But if we have, right. take this in a broader perspective and look at the skill sets we really need to move forward as a country, uh, we see a decrease interest in, in STEM related uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. There's a decrease in these types of careers. Uh, among college kids, among high school students, and, and I guess for a lot of us that's somewhat concerning as we look to the future of our, co of our country. And I think a lot of the dialogue is really what's the skill set we need to have for students moving forward, and how should we teach math, and how should we teach science. And I think that what a lot of the dialogue that's happening is we need to move away from memorization mm -hmm. and just Absolutely. simply recitation mm -hmm. to critical thinking and application, which is how do I take this problem and critically analyze it, and not I can regurgitate the facts back to you, but can you critically analyze it and so what I think that, that what Wikipedia gives us is a, is a medium by which mm -hmm. to have a discussion. Is this a valid site? Is this not a valid source? How do I go about testing the credibility and authenticity of this? So I think it gives us a new medium by which to discuss these issues as we move forward. Well, it helps us construct knowledge. You know, research for eons has told us that when you build your own knowledge and construct it and reteach and really try to synthesize it and analyze it, you learn at much higher levels. So if it does nothing more than that, then it's a game changer for education. But kids, kids can go on their phone and find the capital of North Dakota. Mm -hmm. It's not that you don't want to know it, but when, you, when that information is instantaneous, I would much rather a child that can discuss the difference between two states and their, the products that they produce or something that has happened politically and how that might affect Louisiana than being able to memorize the names of all the states. So I think the information instantaneousness of it is the value that it brings and it ups the learning game when you have to compare and contrast and analyze and we end up with a smarter, uh, you know, a smarter generation of people that really think and, and so I think there's some value there. Mm -hmm. um, well, it might be off topic, but I kind of disagree with you about corporations are less powerful than they used to be. I think we've changed how we shop. I still think the corporations have oh. a lot of power. Oh, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying they're, a lot, they're, le they're less powerful. Okay. They certainly that, are as That powerful. was kind of the impression I'm saying that I we got. Have, we as consumers have more power. Okay, I'm not, I'm not, su not suggesting, as we've seen over the past few years, that corporations are right. losing and their power. Also, I've shopped online for my last truck, found the price online, and then went and bickered with them and got another $400 <laughs> off. So. so it still helps. Personal <laughs> contact helps. That's right. Mayor. That's what I was going to say. I was glad that you said that because I wanted to ask the general because you're in education, that's your focus, but not everybody's in education. Our, the Facebook, where we're older and we're connecting business wise and personal, but I don't think anything will ever replace your grandmother teaching you how to cook or your mother right. teaching you how to knit or your dad sitting with you and teaching you how to uh, work out in math. I think it's wonderful that, that anything that's invented or created is used for a good purpose. And then on the other respect, it can be used for a bad purpose. And I think it's distracting sometimes. I have to give myself a time limit because next thing you know, two hours have gone by and you've done nothing constructive but cracked up when your friends saying all kind of funny things. So uh, there's always a balance in everything. I, I'm like Kim, I, nothing replaces me sitting next to Ben and getting to know about him on one-on-one. -on -one. But all the other stuff can definitely help. I see medicine and education, and but nothing will ever replace one-on-one uh, -on -one to me. So I'm glad you brought that human right. element. We right. will not repla be replaced by machines, hopefully. <laughs> I hope you agree with that. <laughs> and, and yeah. Actually, I think, that we, although we won't be replaced by machines, unfortunately on television, we do end up running out of time. <laughs> and so I think we've run out of time today, but I want to thank our panelists, Dr. Zenos, Dr. Abshire, Ms. Bro, and Dr. Schwartz. When we come back, we'll have a few closing comments. An interesting conversation. Absolutely. I've got to start Facebook and I've got to start tweeting. I'm, I'm behind the times. Well, uh, we also, though I, here at LPB, we have a Facebook page for Public Square. Okay. 
And we're also, you know, podcasting a variety of our um, background pieces as well. And pretty soon we're hoping all public television will be downloadable too, a lot of our shows. Exactly. And, you know, so much of this show, we always run out of time. But the joy now is we can actually do some things online. And so we had some more questions. We had some more uh, discussion. And so hopefully uh, more people will be able to join us online and get, a, get to be a part of this discussion, part of this conversation. We were talking about whether Wikipedia is uh, correcting and perhaps over time. You know, that's the challenge, I guess. If you just looked at it one day, it might not be right. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, and it does change. We, you know, we had students in my class that, that actually changed things on purpose for guest speakers to kind of tweak them about uh, the things they said in class. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's pretty good. It's interesting. <laughs> but, but certainly critical thinking skills are always important. Exactly. About television as well, I think. Absolutely. Well, a special thank you for our youth participants, Ben, David, Dawn, and Julia, members of the Legislative Youth Advisory Council, for their participation tonight. That's all the time we have for this edition of Louisiana Public Square. We invite you to continue tonight's discussion by joining an online chat on Thursday the 28th from 2 to 3 p.m. Alexander Kent, the Shreveport Times online producer and Monica Ford with the State Attorney General's Office will answer your questions live. Visit lpb.org slash public square and click on the chat link. While you're there, take this month's survey and comment on tonight's show. You can also post on our CVX Facebook discussion board like Dawn Gusman did after last month's legislative preview program. She writes, the success or failure of President Obama's stimulus package is still left up to debate. Let's accept some of the money, but let's spend it wisely. Pay off your debts. Don't go buy the most expensive car you've been wanting, Louisiana. Well, thanks for those comments, Don. You can track the spending of federal stimulus dollars as well as other important issues this session on LPB's daily Capital Beat. You can also join us in June as we look back at the highs and lows of the session on Legislative Review 2009. Thanks for watching and good night. Good night, everyone. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org.